All right, if you would, go to uh, 2 Kings. 2 Kings, we're going to take a look at uh, a fine young man. Now, in this picture that we're looking at, uh, he's probably in his mid-20s. I say that because this is good King Josiah. One of the, in fact, uh, he is the last good king. In fact, he is really the last king. His son will take power under the authority of the Egyptians. He's going to die at the age of 39, which to me, he's just a baby. Mikey, how old are you? 38. <laughs> what did I say? Just a baby. Just a baby. Next year, see, when Michael's 39, that's how old this man was, king. Now, he becomes king when he's only eight years old. My Jenna Mayer, how old are you? Eleven. Younger than her. Younger than her. He's eight years old. I was in the third grade at eight. Knew everything, could accomplish everything. I was ready to go at eight years old. This man is going to become the king at eight years old. He lives in a rough time to be the king because Assyria and Babylon are fighting out to see who's going to be the new world power. The Egyptians are backing the Assyrians. Now if you look on a map, unfortunately I don't have one, Judah is down here, Egypt is below him, Assyria is, remember now Assyria has taken over Israel. The ten northern tribes are now pulled into Assyria. So Assyria is sitting on his head and he's got Egypt under his feet. He is being squeezed. Doesn't have an end to top it all off. The Babylonians are rattling their swords. Israel, when he becomes king, well, when he's 13, when he becomes 13, so he is eight, so that's five years away. So 46 years from the time he becomes king, the Babylonian Empire will come in and take Israel captive. In 46 years, that's how close they are. When he gets to be 13 years old, Jeremiah is going to start preaching to the people. And most of his ministry, Jeremiah is preaching. The Babylonians are coming, the Babylonians are coming. Are coming. And the people are saying, no they aren't. No they aren't. And he's saying, the Babylonians are coming. The Babylonians are coming. No, they aren't. No, they aren't. We got good King Josiah. God loves, and it's true, he does love good King Josiah. God has a lot of good things. Look at what it says about him. Now, this is the great-grandson of Hezekiah. Great-grandson. That is what Mr. Christian is to my wife's dad. My wife who was our pastor for many many years who is the grandfather of Michael is the great grandfather of Mr. Christian. Now Josiah didn't know his great grandpa just as my grandkids don't really know their great grandfather. However, not knowing his great-grandfather, Josiah is almost the spitting image of him. He is going to have the same desire for revival that Hezekiah had. He is going to do what he can do to bring about a huge revival, and he does. Brings about a revival just like his great-grandfather. Now, unfortunately, there was his lousy dad, uh, Hezekiah's dad, uh, I'm sorry, Hezekiah's son, which would have been Josiah's grandpa, he was lousy. 
He's the one I told you to put Isaiah in the hollow log and sawed him in half. So that's his grandpa. And then his dad, who we don't want to go there. He was one of the guys who really got false gods back into the, into the country. Really started promoting false deities among the people. That was Josiah's dad. Now Josiah comes at the age of eight years old. He's just a kid. He doesn't really know a whole lot. But at the age of eight, he becomes king. He does have a wonderful high priest who loves the Lord and who begins to teach the king. And Josiah begins to learn at this good man's feet. Eight years old. So a lot of what he is going to do at the age of eight is really the high priest doing it and using the king's name. At about the age of 13, as I told you, one of the great prophets of Israel, probably the second greatest prophet, many will say, behind Isaiah, was Jeremiah the weeping prophet, uh, the writer of Lamentations, the weeping prophet of Israel, uh, because he realizes that in 41 years, when he begins to prophesy, 46 years when he becomes, when Josiah becomes king, 45 years when Jeremiah begins to prophesy, in those 41 years, the Babylonians are coming. And so he begins to tell. So he has a huge influence on this man as well. The high priest and Jeremiah the prophet. Both of them helping him to promote his desire for a revival. Look at the words. They sound a lot like the words we read about Hezekiah, and that's why I wanted to remind you of Hezekiah. There was no king like him before him. That's exactly what God said about Hezekiah. There was no king like him after him, and there was certainly no king like him before him, except for his great-grandson. There was no king like him before him who turned to Jehovah with all of his heart and with all of his soul. What is the commandment that Jesus said? The greatest in the, of the commandments? To love the Lord God with all your heart and mind and soul. He loved, he turned to Jehovah with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his might. He is the fulfillment of that verse that Jesus says is the greatest commandment. This man fulfills the greatest commandment. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful king. According, he does according to all the law of Moses and after him none rose up like him. Of course there's two left and they're going to go to captivity. So no one else even gets a chance. In fact, right after this verse, verse 25, I want to read to you verse 26 because it's real ominous. In verse 26 of chapter 23 of 2 Kings. And hopefully I can read it without my glasses. Okay. Uh, 23, 26. Uh, 23, there you go. Now, Notice the verse we just read. He's done all that the Lord had asked him to do. Notwithstanding is this next verse. Notwithstanding the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath wherewith he was angered against Judah. Even though there was a great king and even though there is a great revival in his time God is still mad at Judah and says, I have determined that the Babylonians would take them. I've written that for years and I'm not changing my mind. Just because there's this last stage of revival. Let's suppose right now that you and I were to allow or to lead America to a great revival. Do you think God would postpone the tribulation because of us? No. 
It's going to come on time. These people have had time and time and time. Jeremiah is preaching, get ready, get ready, get ready. The Babylonians are coming. And the people are saying, ah, you know, we heard that one before. We heard that Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, and guess what? He's not here. Since the day I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, the next day, if not that very day, I heard Jesus is coming. I was a kid back then. I was, how old are you, Mr. Christian? I was the same age as Mr. Christian. October 3rd of this year, I will be the same age that Mr. Christian will be when I became a Christian. October 3rd of this year, Mr. Christian and I will have that in common. In the 16th year of my life, on October 3rd, I became a Christian. Probably October 4th, I heard Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I got to tell you, a couple of years, and you could tell if Mr. Christian was to stand up here next to me, you could tell how many years had gone. Right? I had heard, Jesus is coming, Jesus, everybody I knew who was preaching, Jesus is coming. Those preachers back in the 70s, all that preaching in the 80s, it sort of began to quiet down in the 90s. They're all gone. I'm like Jeremiah. I'm still saying the Babylonians are coming, the Babylonians are coming, and people are saying, we've heard that before. Jeremiah didn't know that they were only 40 years away. But they were. He's saying God is going to bring about your destruction, O Judah. He's already taken Israel captive and now he's coming for you. And God says, even though you got this wonderful king, and then the very next verse after he brags on this king, he says, notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath wherewith he was angered. His anger was kindled against Judah because, and listen to this, because of all the provocative things that Manasseh had provoked him with. His grandpa is the reason that God didn't change his mind. Wow. How about there's a great revival coming, but because of what? Which one of us in this room should I pick on now? Let's see, let's see. Who should I pick on? <laughs> well, let's pick on that young lady in that wheelchair right there. She was so bad that God says, I don't care about the revival because of what she did. She ticked me off so much that I'm still going to kick you people out of here. Wow! I tell you. Poor Josiah, his grandpa was so bad that God said, that's it. What he did when he sawed Isaiah in half, my prophet, the greatest of my prophets, he stuck him in a hollow log and he sawed him in half. I don't care what you do, I'm still holding it against you all for what your grandpa did. Now, my grandchildren better hope that grandpa didn't do a whole lot bad. Because it don't matter what you grandkids do. I'm holding it again you because of what your grandpa did. You may have had a wonderful mother. Maybe your dad was second to none. You probably had the greatest auntie cake that anybody ever had. But your grandpa, now he did it. He did it. That's where Josiah is. And, and, and I share this with you because I want to tell you a little bit about him. First of all, let's take a look at some of the good. He was a good man. He was a good king for Judah. Brought about a huge revival from the time he was 16 years old. Through the rest of his life, he is going to spend his time getting the people to come back to the Lord. Getting the people to serve the Lord. When he's 16 years old, 
He says to the people, you know what? You see the temple of God over there that we have allowed to fall apart? I'm going to pay men. He sent money down to the high priest and he said, now I want you to hire carpenters and rocksmiths or whatever they call them, people, masons. And I want you to hire people to fix up God's house because we're going to reopen it. Why they go down there, they tear. Remember his daddy nailed the doors shut. So the carpenters come down now and they pull out the big old nails that were there and they have to patch up and fix the, the ornate doors and all that kind of stuff that was destroyed. And lo and behold, the high priest walks into the temple. And as they're cleaning the temple up, the high priest finds the Bible. Can you imagine? I found the Bible in the church. That's pretty much where America is at. People are surprised if they find a Bible in the church. And he goes into the house of God. He finds the word of God. He finds the Bible. He finds the Old Testament books. He finds the books of Moses. The high priest does. And they run and they tell Josiah, we have found the book. Josiah says, bring it up here and read it to me. They begin to read to him the law of Moses. And as he begins to hear the law of Moses, he realizes how wicked is, Judah has become. When God says, thou shalt not, and they were doing it. And God says, don't do this, and they're doing it. Pretty soon he finds out that we're not doing anything that God told us to do. And it strikes fear into his heart. So he begins to enforce the laws of God. Now, the people begin to follow him. They didn't so much follow God, but they liked their king. And out of honor for the king, they began to set aside their idols. Not that they were wholeheartedly like him. They were not wholeheartedly following after God. They were following after a great preacher. They were following after a great king. A lot of people go to church because they have the world's greatest preacher. They go to this guy because he's so charismatic. They don't know what he's saying, but oh, he's just so charismatic. They never get saved. They never come under conviction. They just like what they're hearing. And he's such a wonderful person pastor that we got to go to his church they never get close to Jesus there's never revival in their life that's not what the man is there for Josiah although he is very earnest about it most of the people will follow him because they respect him and not because they want it's like Jesus many of the people followed him and he said you know what you're following me because you ate the bread you're following me because you like the fish, not what I'm saying. You're not following me because you believe in my words. You're following me because of the miracles you've seen. A lot of people followed Jesus because of the miracles they saw. Not because of what he was teaching. And so not for what Josiah is saying, but because he was such a nice guy. People are following him. He sought God and he was open to what God might say to him. And he tried to translate that out to the people. But remember now, the people have had his grandpa and his dad to lead them astray. So we're not surprised then that they're not listening to the grandson. We've already had others. So he was a great reformer though, like his great grandfather. He tried to do his best to bring people to the Lord, just as his great grandpa did. He cleanses the temple. He revives the idea of obedience to God. See, he's all about getting, but it's so close to the end that it's kind of hard to still reach people. And I think in America, we're kind of in that same situation. We can't quit. But we're so close to the end. I don't know. 
You know, after Josiah passes at the age of 39, there's only a few more years left. Two kings, neither one of them served very long. One serves really under the Egyptians and the other one serves under the Babylonians. And then they say, ah, we don't like them anyway and pull them out. <laughs> so they're not very far from their destruction, but they don't even realize it. And the world in which we live in is so close to their destruction, but we don't believe it anymore. The world is all about it. The world will make movies about the apocalypse. They always talk about the apocalypse. The world is waiting for the apocalypse to happen. The North Koreans launch a rocket. Everybody says, this is the apocalypse. It's the end of the world. When... Trump got elected. It's the end of the world. It's the apocalypse. And here he is. He's bringing it in with him. Everybody in the world is talking about the end of the world except for God's people. We're saying, oh, we heard that story before. We're the ones tired of it. We're the ones not talking about Jesus coming again. We sort of feel a little funny even when we sing the song. Jesus is coming. That was I, uh, Jose, uh, Josiah's problem. His people had lived through so much and they were so close to the end they couldn't see it. But he was a good man in his time, which was a hard time to be a good man. The temple is nailed shut it would have been easy for him to ignore it. But instead he gets a gun. You know how hard it was for him to go against everything his father and everything his grandfather had set up and to go against everything that everybody was. The only one trying to work at this point was God. He had raised up a wonderful high priest and a couple of very godly prophets. Jeremiah being one of those. So at least he didn't leave the king. See God knew and so he didn't leave the king alone. Now, for all of his good, though, and here's the problem with all of your good. There's always something that you mess up on, isn't there? Josiah, who had seen God do a lot, God had promised him, you know what, I'm going to make sure that you live in peace to the end of your days and you'll be carried away to your fathers. I'm going to make sure that happens. You're going to live in peace to the day you die. Remember I warned you earlier, I was telling you earlier about the Egyptians were down here, the Assyrians are up here, and the Babylonians are out here. The Assyrians and the Babylonians are fighting. The Babylonians are getting too strong too fast. So God talks to the king of Egypt and he says to Nico, the king of Egypt, go up and fight against the Babylonians. I'll give you victory. Who are you? I'm the God of the Israelites. I'm the God of Judah. Go do what I told you to do. So Nico gets up because God told him to. He gets his vast army and they're cutting through Judah. They're, Judah hears about it, starts to chase after them, catches up with him in the valley of Megiddo. You know where Megiddo, you ever, you, the whole thing about Armageddon, that's, that's what it's named for. So the king of Judah chases him down, catches up to him, and the king of uh, Egypt says, listen, don't go home. The God, your God, your God, our God told me to go and ally myself with the Assyrians and hold back the Babylonians. This isn't between you and me. Your God told me to do this. Well, guess who God forgot to tell? Right? God didn't tell Josiah. Now, he was warned by the king, 
The king said to him, your God told me this. I'm doing what your God wants me to do. Josiah wouldn't cut, wouldn't let loose. He keeps chasing after him. So the king says to his archers, and the king, Josiah, is disguised. So no, remember we saw this happen before. He disguises himself so that Nico doesn't know he's still chasing him. So Nico says to his archers, turn around, just shoot a bunch of arrows back that way. And they do. And one of those arrows nails Josiah and he dies. The bad, he got involved in a military conflict that he was warned not to get involved in. You're going to live in peace to the day you die. He did. <laughs> he just died a little earlier then. But he had peaceful days. Up until this one, everything went his way. Until God said to him through another man, go home. I'm doing God's business. Well, sometimes, what do we say? I'm the only one. I alone am serving God. There is none other. There can't be another preacher like me. There can't be another church like ours. We, that's what all cults say, aren't they? We are the only one. If you don't come through our door, you ain't getting in. God, there you go. We're going to have some in the thing right after sir. <laughs> Got green Kool-Aid for everybody. No. So here we go. He is told, he is warned, he's asked, he's begged, but he's pretty sure that God only listens to his people. God wouldn't listen to or talk to an Egyptian, even though the Egyptian said, Jehovah told me, and nobody knows that name but the Jews. I'm doing what your God, Jehovah, told me to do. Go home. Let me do this. What he was trying to do is to make sure that they had those few more years. But he wouldn't listen. I alone serve the Lord. I'm the only one that can tell you the secret words you got to know. Anytime somebody tells you that, go away. Run. Close up your wallet and get out of there. He gets involved in a military conflict that he was warned. Not, that's the only bad thing we could find about him. He did everything that the high priest instructed him to do. He encouraged Je uh, Jeremiah during the days of his preaching. He heeded the words of Jeremiah and did his best to assist Jeremiah in this great revival. He got rid of everything and everybody in the land that was bad. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits, the wizards, those with images and idols, and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, did Josiah put away. Hey, you're talking to dead people. You can't do that in my country. Very popular. Hey, wizards, you can't have that. You can't have people dealing with spirits and talking to the dead and all the rest of those things. You can't have that. You can't have people calling on false de deities and false gods. Not in Judah. Not while I'm king. And so he removes all of those things by force. He sends his army in and they smash this and they smash that. A lot of the revival was a forced revival. And that's how come it doesn't really change anything. And that's how come they're still taken captive by the Babylonians. Because even though they followed because they admired him or were afraid of him, it didn't seek into people's hearts. If we had the power to put everybody who didn't believe in Jesus in jail if they didn't attend your church, jails would be full. And even those that did come to your church wouldn't be getting there for Jesus. They'd be coming because they don't want to. How many people pray the sinner's prayer because they don't want to go to hell, not because they want to receive Jesus as their Savior? 
People are afraid of hell, but not in love with Christ. That's why the rich man said to Abraham, Abraham, send someone from here to go and warn my family. If they don't listen to the prophets, if they don't listen to the law and the prophets, they won't listen. Listen, if you don't listen to the word of God, you won't believe a miracle. Miracles aren't strong enough. Even if a dead person, because listen, a dead person did come back to life. And he did say, I told you I was who I said I was. And they still didn't believe him. The high priest covered the story of the resurrection up with a lie and with money. Here was Jesus who they know died, who they witnessed being buried, who they knew full well rose from the dead. What did they do with it? Did any of them believe the story of Christ? Even though there were over 500 witnesses, did they believe? No, they paid people to tell the lie instead of accepting the truth. So Josiah comes and he breaks down the false places of worship. He executes all the false teachers, the wizards and the witches and everybody else. But it doesn't really make a difference. Because the outside is a long way from the inside. People can pretend they can come to church and look just like us. They can say all the same things that we say. They can do all the things that we do. Remember the story about the wheats and the tares? Let them all grow together. Because you guys aren't expert enough to tell the difference between a real Christian and a fake one. But wait, when I send the angels, let them do the division. You and I aren't allowed to be judges because we're not good enough to tell the difference between the truth and the lie. 